This morning we begin a new series. We're turning to the book of Revelation. And we're going to be taking an in-depth look at the seven churches that John wrote to. Each week we will look at a, a different church, a new church. This morning, of course, our church is the church in Ephesus. But we'll get there in a moment. There once was a Dutch diamond collector, and he was seeking a very rare diamond. There was a dealer in New York by the name of Mr. Winston, Winston, and he heard of this inquiry, and he contacted him, letting him know that he believed that he possessed the diamond that he was looking for. So the diamond collector arrived in New York, and Mr. Winston had his best salesman to present the diamond. The salesman described all the technical aspects of the diamond, how beautifully it was cut, how it would shine and, and gleam so brightly. However, within mere minutes, the diamond collector rose his hand and said that this was not what he was looking for. Watching from a distance, Mr. Winston hurriedly intercepted him as he was walking out and asked him if he could present the diamond again. And the collector agreed. Mr. Winston pulled out the same exact diamond that the salesman had shown the collector already and started describing his admiration for this particular diamond. And within minutes, they were signing papers, and he purchased the diamond. As the gentleman was walking out, he asked what just happened. Why was it so easy for me to say no to your salesman a little while ago, while with you, I purchased the diamond? Mr. Winston answered. He said, that salesman is the best in the business. He knows more about diamonds than anyone, including myself. And I paid him a large salary for his knowledge and expertise. But I would gladly pay him twice as much if I could put into him something I have which he lacks. You see, he knows diamonds, but I love them. You see, the same is true in soul winning. Many Christians have much Bible knowledge, but do not share Christ with the lost. While others may not have as much knowledge of the Bible, but they love Christ so much that they tell others about him and press them to accept him as their savior. You don't have to be a Bible scholar to share Christ. Amen. In fact, you'll probably be a much better sharer of the gospel and a much more successful witnesser if you don't have a whole lot of Bible knowledge. Because you won't be so caught up in the details. But you can share your story. You can share what Christ did on the cross for you and for others. The salesman was simply doing his job. He knew how to sell diamonds. But he had lost or never had the passion and the fire for the diamonds. Turn with me to Revelations chapter 2, and we'll, be, we'll begin reading in the first verse. Please stand with me for the reading of the word. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in the first verse. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, 
These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, for John, the revelator, who wrote down this book, the one that is also considered so often as mysterious and veiled. But yet, Lord, we believe this morning you're going to open it up to us. And so, Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit this morning to open our hearts, our minds, and your word that we may receive it, understand it, and apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Lord introduces himself to the church of Ephesus as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Most of the descriptions of the Lord are in these letters are similar to that which is found in chapter 1. But here he talks to the church in Ephesus. Ephesus is a seaport city. It was the administrative and commercial hub of the Roman province of Asia. It was an important city. It's the same place where Paul labored and to whom the letter of Ephesians was written to. But yet, they're being given a warning. But let us first take a look at the application of the church. He doesn't just go into them and say, you're doing everything wrong. First, he says, I commend you on the things you are doing right. They were commendable in their works and in their labor. They were doing good things. They were continuing to carry forth the truth. Of the gospel. They were preaching the gospel. They were doing the works of a church and ministering to those who were in need. In fact, their work was outstanding, it was plentiful. They worked hard, they were commendable in their patience. They didn't simply try for a little while and then give up. They didn't hear that the Lord was coming, and so they were going to try for a five or ten years, and then when he didn't come, set him aside for something else. They were patient, patiently waiting on the Lord, patiently continuing to share the gospel, trying to get more people to understand that Christ is the Savior. They were also commendable in their standard. The Lord commended them that they did not tolerate evil in their midst. They held a high standard. What we would consider a standard of holiness. Which is so lacking in America. Which is so lacking 
in the churches today, not just in America, but all across the globe. Yesterday, I had a conversation with a man at work. And as we were driving back from Sparta, we, his pastor had called him and, and he talked with him for a little while. And, and so now the door was open. I had a free reign opportunity to, to talk about Christ. Amen. Now, of course, this was already a man who knew Christ. So it was much easier to talk about Christ and to talk about the relationship that I have with him and, and so on. But I continued to, to go back and forth with him. And I said, you know, I've experienced so much in my short 26 years of life that many may never experience in a full life. I said, but my need for the Savior was the same as theirs. I said, we've grown up in a world, we've, we've raised a society in which the truth is simply what you believe it to be. That there is no set in stone truth. And he said, well, you know, people choose to live their life and they should be punished, you know, by us if they choose to live that way. And I said, you're absolutely right. I am not the one to go around and put people into jail because I don't agree with their lifestyle. But I also don't have to accept it. I also am not going to condone it if it is against Scripture. I said, when it gets down to the very core of it, we all have the same problem, and that's sin. And we all have the opportunity for the same solution, the only solution, and that is Christ. Amen. But yet he kept wanting to tell me, well, they have a different life story. They have different experiences. And I said, you're right, they do. But sin is still the problem and Christ is still the answer. That's it. Amen. And when we hold ourselves to that standard, the standard that is so clearly defined in Scripture, that sin is the problem and Christ is the answer, God will be look upon us with favor and he will commend our standard when we do not allow evil they were also commendable in their courage this was the Roman Empire this was before Constantine and before Roman the Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire before Christianity was forced on the entire empire They endured the trials. They endured the adversity with patience. And they labored tirelessly. When the false apostles came and the false preachers and the false prophets, and they all came and they tested them. And they knew that these were false people because what they said did not line up with the word. With what Paul said had taught them with what Christ had taught them. And so even in the warning to the church in Ephesus, they had some commendable traits about them. There were things that they were doing right. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. There was an abatement of their love, an abandonment of their love. They had a loss of love in relation to Christ. And it's indicated in the areas of prayer. When a church stops praying, they lose a relationship with Christ. They lose a relationship with God. The second is in their personal devotions. When a church and the individual stops having personal devotions with God, they lose a connection. 
They lose that relationship that ties them with the spot with the father. And when they've lost their prayer and when they've lost their personal devotions, they lose their personal vows. The vows that we made to the Lord that said, Father, I will do this. Father, I will not do that. We lose our first love. Amen. And that's the tragedy of the church in Ephesus. They had lost their first love. They had left their first love. The fire of its affection had died out. The glowing enthusiasm of its early days had disappeared. The Christians could look back to better days when their bridal love for Christ flowed warm, full, and free. They were still sound in doctrine and they were still active in service, but the true motive of all worship and service was missing. We've all been in churches where they did the right things, they said the right things, and yet their services were empty. They may have been full of people, but the Spirit of the Lord was not there. Amen. They're asleep. Because they had lost their first love. The loss of love in relation to the church is indicated today by a decline of interest. And haven't we seen that in America? Haven't we seen that in most modern Western countries? There's a lack of interest in anything doing and pertaining to God. Unless it's the God that I create. Unless it's the God of nature. The God of the trees. The God of astrology. There's a decay of burden. You say, well... That should be a good thing. We should have decays of burden because if we're with Christ, then our burden is lifted from us. Except for the fact that we should have a burden for the lost souls. But that burden has fallen away. And we're more worried about maintaining our building, maintaining our image in, in culture and in society that we push off the ones who don't look like us. We push off the ones who don't smell like us, who don't act like us. And there's a deterioration of faithfulness. People all, I've heard people say that, well, everybody went to church on Sunday mornings back in the day because there was nothing else to do. All the businesses were closed. The theaters weren't open. The restaurants were closed. And that may be. I did not grow up in that era. When I grew up, everything was open. From Monday morning till Sunday night. It didn't matter what time of day it was, you could find somewhere to go. I did grow up in a day where sports did not take place on Wednesday evenings or on Sundays. How far we have fallen. A deterioration of faithfulness when members of the church may show their face once or twice a month without any real reason behind their absence. Where has
has our love for Christ gone? And so Christ appeals to them. He says, remember. Remember where you were, how far you have fallen. He says, repent. What does repent mean? It means to turn away from those things. Turn away from the evil things, the past things. Turn toward what is right and what is holy. Then he says, revive. Do the first works. So he tells them to remember the good days of their early faith. To repent of their diminishing of first love and to repeat the devoted service which characterized the outset of their Christian life. I truly believe that if we could see just a few people get saved in this church. That their fire would light the rest of us. Amen. Because I know that it's hard for us who have been a Christian for a while. Our oil lamp has gone dry sometimes. The fire burns out and we haven't replenished the wood. Or sometimes it's the trials and the burdens and the struggles of life that pours water on our wood and it just puts out the flame or it's just smoldering and, and we think, God, we just want to see that same flame again. And so we try to do things, trying to revive the flame and they try to carry forth the flame except for we don't go back to the beginning and say, Father, that same fervor that you poured into me on that day poured into me again. The greatest revivals in history started in the most unlikely of places with the most likely of people. And I know that God wants to see another great revival. But we have to do our part. Lehman Strauss once said, a wife or a husband may remain faithful and may give evidence of careful attention in matters pertaining to each other. And yet there may be a decline in first love. Similarly, a church member may be very regular in his or her attendance at the services. But no amount of activity, however intense, can compensate for a lack of love. Do not let yourself be fooled into thinking that your activity, that your good works, compensate for a lack of love, for a lack of fire burning in your soul for Christ. And for those who are lost. This is what was written to the church in Ephesus. Nearly 2,000 years ago. And how true it is for us today. Amen. The word of the Lord is living. And it will never be returned void. And so this morning we can look at what Christ called that church to do. He called them to remember. To repent. And to revive. I don't know if you know this or not, but. 
almost two and a half years ago now when, when I came to Heartland. There were people who were telling me, do not go there. If you do, it will be the last church that you pastor. They said, that's a dead church. And I looked at them and I said, God has told me otherwise. God didn't show me what the church was or what the church is. He showed me what the church would be. And this is a church of potential. And I praise God that he's placed me here in this day and in this age to carry this church, to lead this church into new, better and brighter days. Even brighter than the ones that we remember. Even stronger and greater than the ones that we could ever revive. Because it will be a church of greatness. Not because of me or because of what you have done. But because of what Christ is going to do in this place. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Don't listen to what the world tells you. And sometimes don't even listen to what church people tell you. Listen to what God tells you. Amen. Remember, repent, and revive. Oh, what great days are ahead in this new year. Shall we stand? Father, we are so grateful this morning for the word that you have shared with us. For the encouragement that has been within the word, even though when so many people look at the seven churches in Revelation and they go, Oh, my word, may we never fall into those traps. May we not end up like they ended up, Lord. But, Father, may we look at them to see at them as an example and to hear the appeal that came from Christ, to remember how far we have fallen from, to remember our beginning, that we may repent and turn back to what we once were, and may we try to revive the flames. But, Father, we know that you are the one who holds the oil. We know that you are the one who holds the match. So, Father, pour out on us an overflowing of your Holy Spirit, of that blessing anointing oil. And, Father, may you strike the match and set us ablaze for a new year, for another year of service to you. May it not be a year just full of service that's lacking love, but may it be full of love and commitment to you. And may those same people who looked upon this church and said they were dead. May they turn around and say, what is going on there? And we'll simply say, it is Christ. Amen. Father, go with us. Lead, guide, and direct us throughout this week, Lord, that we may share, may we have a burden for the lost. Give us the wisdom, the strength, and the courage, Lord. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.